So this is a spot where we had some evidence that might have elevated levels of radioactivity. And now we're just gonna come up with some places to be able to take some samples. And I get closer down into this pit right here it sort of buries the needle. And that sort of has me interested, wondering what we might be seeing down here. Considering what you know about the site, do you think North County can really be cleaned up completely? I think that if you have widespread radioactivity that's kind of been moved around by floods and other types of you know, natural events, it could be a pretty big problem. What, honey? You want to play with a sticky note? Mom, can I go outside? No, honey, I don't really want you to do that right now. I don't. Can you, can you guys go downstairs and play? Why don't you want them out? I, there's a weather pattern coming in, and I know that it's going to stink either tonight or tomorrow, and I really don't want them out there. Um, you know, some of this you can smell, some of this you can't, and it's just, it's not something that I'm going to take the chance on. Which is sad, because it looks beautiful out there. We just cut the grass. It would be a great afternoon, perfect temperature for kids to go out. But you know, it's one of the things that we think about living here. We watch the weather, not for rain, not for severe weather, but to figure out what's going to happen with the landfill or try and predict how it's going to be. It's a shame, isn't it? 
Beautiful neighborhood, nice park for kids to play when it isn't stinking. That's how it is down here. We're kind of hidden back here behind this hill, but it doesn't stop that stench one bit. We didn't hear about the radioactivity until the, the stink of the landfill started. I guess it, if it wasn't for the smell, we, no one would have known about the radioactivity. directly across the street from the landfill. There's no getting around it. We're less than a thousand feet. Two days ago, in the evening time, that's what my smoke detector was doing and my carbon monoxide was doing, which notifies me if I need to get inside and close the doors even tighter and put towels up against the bottom of my door. You see that lump? My dogs, all of them, have a lump. And then these strawberry things, we don't even know what they are. He has them all over, and they come up. Look, they just appear, and they turn into these really super bad sores. He's got all these, and they just make him so miserable. He just tries to do the best he can. I We've got this class that's going to be on monitoring nuclear events. It's going to be given by the uh, 7th Civil Support Team. It's a four-segment class, and they decided to go ahead and include first responders because we're going to be the ones going in when everybody else is bailing out. I'll turn it over to the guys now to start this class. All right. You're going to see a D-ring to the side. That D-ring, you turn it. It opens up that battery well. Now, uranium is in the ground, is it not? It comes from the Manhattan Project. That's right. The decay product of uranium is radon. What's the problem with radon? Say it again. It causes cancer. Causes cancer is a better emitter. And if it gets out, how easy is it going to be in Missouri to contain people in St. Louis area? It's going to be tough. Now, like those people walk around with all this stuff on them, on their cars, and their goods, take some of that material elsewhere and spread that problem, that's where it was going to become tricky. First, I got a fire underneath the ground. Then I got radioactive material underneath the ground that may be breached by this fire. Danger zone. Time to get out. If you could perform a rescue at that point, I would. Please don't leave me behind. Don't leave your buddy behind. Uh, but it's not a time to decide, what do we do now? Please back out. That's the unfortunate thing, is this all happened in a metropolitan area. It does not belong in a residential slash commercial municipal populated suburban area in the state that it is in right now and has been for the last 40 years. Let's fix it. Let's not just leave it sit out there. If this encroaching underground smoldering event reached where the radioactivity is located, in the incineration of materials, very small particles can be released and those particulates can be contaminated with the radionuclides. What's going to be carried along with those smoke particles are particles of thorium, particles of radium. You know, sometimes particles can be carried five, six miles away from the site where it's burning. You know, I have my escape route planned. I literally do. I have my grab bag, I have it in the car have a little emergency kit, and we go that way. The landfill is that way. We go straight down the street, we make a left, and we go straight. Hello. Hello. Hello, Megan. We have our yeah. questions set up for tonight. You guys want to go through them all real quick and yeah. see what we have so far? The EPA has always said that the isolation barrier is the contingency plan. 
And now that the fire can be moving into the North Quarry, what is EPA's plan B? Uh, if the isolation barrier isn't going to be able to be installed in time to stop a smoldering fire once it moves into North Quarry. I think we should phrase it like that. What is your contingency for the contingency plan that is yeah. the barrier? Right. Mm -hmm. You know? Um, do you remember what the date was that the EPA called for the barrier? It was last it was, summer, right? It was, so they had a year yeah. to get all the testing and data that they needed to figure out if they even could or could not do this barrier, and they haven't. They've wasted a year. Let's write that one down. And the million dollar question is what happens when the fire meets the waste? No, it's the waste. What meets happens the fire. when the waste That's meets right. the fire? That's right. That's right. I think we really need to hammer that home. When I met Karen Nickel, she had already created a Facebook page, and so there were maybe about a hundred or so people on it. I joined, we hit the ground running. We created Just Moms because we were told if you're going to organize and you're going to host public meetings, you have to call yourself something. And we're like, well, we're just moms. We're like, we're just moms STL, St. Louis. Yeah. I'm going to tell you yeah. right now. Yeah, and I mean it. I gotta go. I'd rather be home with you guys. Yeah, but it might be important stuff. That's right. There'll be lots of important stuff. That's why God made me. That's why God made Oh, that's really actually sad. That's why God made meetings. All right, dog, look out. Look out, let him in, let him in. Thank you, Come on, Dougie. OK, I got to go, I love you. Oh, is that chilly? Is that my dress? Yeah. Man, I don't even have time to try it on. OK, well. He's invited to his first birthday party. Oh, you're going too? Look, it's right there. No, this is Quinn's. Oh, oh. Quinn's okay. invited to his first birthday ah, party. Yeah. Okay, bye-bye. I love you, too. Bye, baby girl. Bye, boy. Bye, boy. Bye, boy. I can't Well, I don't have the movies on. God, I feel my anxiety rising. I hate that. Literally, like, every time I come to the stoplight, if I'm on my way to one of these meetings, my anxiety level, I can just feel it start in my stomach. And I'm like, I don't know. So much rides on these meetings, it's like do or die, literally. Good evening, everybody. I'd like to call this meeting to order, please. We have the Army Corps of Engineers make a presentation this evening about radioactive safety levels. All right. I just want to say thank you, everybody, for your time. Uh, we appreciate this chance to come out here and talk a little bit. So we have a lot of data and a very good understanding of the health impacts from radiation at very high doses. What we don't really have is any good data on low levels of exposure and what the harmful effects might be. This equation right here is just sort of a simplified example of how we calculate risk. Um, when we actually input these parameters, we try to use the conservative assumptions for, well, how much could a human being conceivably inhale in a day? Can I just clarify? I, I just a small question. You said there are no, what'd you say? There's no good data on low level exposure? Correct. So what are these risk models based off of? Risk models are based on data from like atomic weapon survivors, from um, industrial accidents and things like that. Where are the health studies anywhere that show that if I build my home on nuclear weapons waste, what happens to my kids 30 years later? I think you have to understand in terms of Westlake and what we're dealing with and the potential of this fire hitting it and letting it out, you guys could be wrong. OK, I don't want to interrupt you, Doug, but I'm Mary Peterson with the Environmental Protection Agency, and I'll, I'll take a stab at this as best I can. Um, so what Joe was talking about was how uh, we do risk assessment, OK? It's not based on statistics, OK? It's not based on actual cases of cancer. It's based on a probability that people could have an increased risk of getting cancer. OK, Mary, I, I want to uh, just pick up on this. 
There is a report about the progress of the fire. Now, we have concern that these particles can become airborne if they're hit by the landfill fire. And the rate the fire has been progressing, I understand that these things take time, but... Uh, I, I don't think there's been conclusive evidence of the movement of, of the SSE. That's my understanding, is that there are differing opinions on that. We've heard the EPA say that it's planned for the fires, the isolation barrier but the radioactive wastes have not been properly identified. The EPA currently doesn't know where they're all at. So what is the contingency? Because you guys are in charge of the radioactive waste and you make it sound as if you're not gonna do anything until the fire is at the doorstep and that's not comforting to a lot of the folks here. <laughs> we're not waiting until it's at the doorstep. We're on a timeline, okay, to make a decision regarding an isolation barrier uh, within the next couple months. And then the 14 to 18 months is the time frame for the design to be completed. It just, it would have been nice if it was done two years ago. But it's extending the length of this and it's excruciating to this community. I guess with what you know already, how many of you would be willing to buy a house right near this particular site? I wouldn't have any qualms with regard to radioactivity contamination, no. And I actually have quite a bit of family in this area, so not, not right in Bridgeton, but fairly close, St. Charles, neighbors. Yeah, I mean, you can't tell me that you would buy a house in the backyard of this landfill. I don't believe it. I don't believe anybody here would have the guts to admit that they wouldn't want to live here. Yeah, it would be nice if we could schedule when the stench is coming, rather than abruptly being awakened in the middle of the night because you smell the crap coming through your windows and you're thinking, what the heck, am I dreaming? Yeah, I'm living Thank a nightmare. You. I have something to say. Do you have a question about the risk assessment? I have something to say, yes. I was born and raised in Spanish Village in 1971 to 1977. I buried my 12-year-old daughter to a glioblastoma brain tumor. I have three other children at home sick. And you want to live here? You honestly want to live here? No. And, <laughs> Tell and me, I'm, do you? I'm, because I can't I'm, physically bury another child, OK? I, I can't. And you tell me you want to live here. Nine eighteen here at Big 550 KTRS. Joining us now is Russ Naki, Vice President of Communications for Republic Services. Your company owns the Bridgeton Landfill, which has been in the uh, other news. Yeah, you know, I just want to leave your, your audience with, uh, with this point. Bridgeton Landfill is safe. It is in a managed state. We're going to continue to manage that reaction, and eventually it will self-extinguish. It would, so the fire will just burn out naturally? Eventually, we believe it will self-extinguish. Before yes. it gets to the nuclear waste? Absolutely. Russ Naki, Vice President of uh, Communications, uh, thank you for your time. Thanks for having me. excited to be here. This is a good fight. This is a really good fight. So one of the things you said is you didn't have any training. Well, guess what? Today's your lucky day. And you have to take all of the beliefs you once had about how change happens and just throw them out the window. So Don, you want to start? Hi, my name is Don Chapman, and I'm just a mom. Um, I have three kids. This is not a career choice. This is not where I thought I'd be right now. Um, 
respect, I got a little emotional because I can't. It's not the fact that Lois Gibbs is here. I think it's the fact that we need you. Sorry, I'm crying. Uh, we all take turns crying. People don't see that, that we really are just moms and we're scared. Well, I call myself the accidental environmentalist. You know, it's a story of literally thousands and thousands and thousands, mostly women across the country who never thought they would be. And then, blah. Just pass the word around. Nobody, we're not going to do anything violent. We're just going to keep them in the house. Nothing more than that. Body barricade the doors, OK? Don't good enough. And don't let them out. OK, pass the word. Yeah. That's all? Right. Nobody else. This word just in, two federal environmental officials are being held hostage at the Love Canal Homeowners Association's headquarters. People there stirred up by an announcement that residents' chromosome damage may be linked to toxic chemical exposure. If we do not have a disaster declaration Wednesday by noon, then what they have seen here today is just a Sesame Street picnic in President Carter will sign the pact committing $15 million in federal funds to buy up the homes of Love Canal residents. I want to recognize the grassroots leader of the Love Canal residents, Lois Gibbs. Without her impassioned advocacy, a disagreement might never have come to pass. There must never be, in our country, another Love Canal. Thank you very much. It is possible for you to win what you want, but it's not possible to win it all at the same time. It's a long-term, short-term thing, and you have to be disciplined about what you're doing. And so in order to set those goals, you need to figure out goals for what, and really put together a plan of action. Do you think Beaver Tail still has that little park there, Dad? Well, I'm sure the piece of ground is there. Whether or not it's been maintained, I would have no idea. But that's where you guys used to cross the creek, was down there off of Beaver Tail all the time. Mm-hmm. Now, here's our old house right here on the left. Oh, my gosh, look at our bushes. Yeah. Oh, my God, our porch is falling apart. We got a... Our fence is falling down. Remember when we first moved in, this was just a natural creek. There was no concrete. No sides, no fence. And it's, no, we just and climbed right down to it. When they did this, the kids couldn't cross the creek anymore. You used to be able to just climb down and climb over. <laughs> you know, Sam and Anita, they're both passed away from cancer on the corner down there. The Clarks over here on the left, three people in that family died of cancer, including two children when they lived there. Wayne, across the street, he has cancer. I mean, just right here in this street, there is a lot of people who have passed away from cancer. Oh, my goodness. You could still climb it. Not as pretty as I remember. The concrete starts right there, doesn't it? Yeah. Wow. So kids could still crawl through this creek here. Yeah. If I had a dollar for every time I crossed that creek. <sighs> it was the spring of 2011. I got on Facebook in order to reconnect with people from high school. And we all immediately started noticing that so many of us were sick. 
As you look through the yearbooks, you can see there are a lot of people who are no longer with us who passed away of very bizarre cancers. Because at first, we thought maybe there's a problem with our high school. Maybe our high school has something in it when they built it that is causing health problems. But when I started finding out that my grade school friends who went to a different high school were battling the same diseases, it became very eerie. I realized, wait a minute, this is not some toxin or whatever in that high school. It's much bigger than that. Now in Coldwater Creek, meandered all through our neighborhoods. It is the dividing line between the school districts We've discovered that the Department of Veterans Affairs officially recognizes around 21 cancers associated with exposure to ionizing radiation and compared that list to what we had. We had all of those cancers, every single one. We then took all that information and made maps. The first maps were extremely alarming. I started color coding different issues with people. So if I could see, is there any kind of rhyme or reason to the dots and what what is this? What do we really have here? What's happening? It's healing up so beautifully. Those are all my major I guess. So, is it? Jonas's cancer is in the soft tissue behind his sinuses, so it's inoperable. Ionized radiation is one of the reasons for Ewing's. So, um, I think that's a, a big indicator with what's going on with Coldwater Creek. Over the summer, it started like right here, and my face started to become numb and my jaw started to lock up a little bit. And that was uh, the summer of 2011. Um, it was around my 13th birthday, right at the end of school to about midsummer. And then around midsummer, I think it was like July 4th, that it actually like hit. And uh, I went to the hospital and stayed there for like two months. You can close your eyes too if you want. Do you need anything? Mm -hmm. Okay. I think I might take a nap. Okay. I believe that I was poisoned by the creek and the nuclear dumping that went on there, and that my son inherited this kind of disease from that. My neighborhood was a hot spot, and the children who were raised there are now having very sick children. My sisters, three of us have had children, and each of us has had one very sick child. I'm really grateful to the people really looking into this because I don't have time to do that. My life is invested here in trying to help my son get through this. We anticipate going home with hospice care if we make it home.
step one that's angered me and kept me awake at night in nightmares is that all the basements of my childhood friends' homes were flooded with thorium-230 water mm -hmm. in the 1970s and 1980s, and people live in those houses. What are we going to do to get in those houses to test those basements? What do we do about that? So crux of the meeting with the Army Corps is to update the public with where are they at on their testing and the remediation. Just in St. Louis alone, they've already taken out 1.2 million cubic yards of contaminated material. Right now, the places where they found it is in the embankment levels of Coldwater Creek, which are, you know, the wall areas above the water line. I think the most important thing for people to know is what's been cleaned up and what hasn't, and then who's sick. Mm -hmm. so thank you, everybody, for coming out tonight. The formerly utilized site remedial action program, FUSRAP, with the Corps of Engineers is going to be our first speaker. They're going to give us updates on this cleanup project. And this has been ongoing for a long time, it began in the 90s, and we're here to make sure everyone knows it's still going on and what progress is being made. Why wouldn't we have signs along the creek? I mean, I think that has to go on somebody's agenda. What's your sign gonna say? That's it's the, gonna that's... say, warning, don't go in this creek. <laughs> I don't know. I... That's good. It's... That's No, that's not a bad idea, because a lot of people who live in our community have no clue that there's nuclear weapons waste in this community. They have no idea that it isn't contained safely somewhere and being watched over. Amen. That's right. Regarding why we don't have signs up around Coldwater Creek, to date, we haven't found any contamination that would justify putting up signs. It currently doesn't present immediate risk, so there's no long-term exposure. Yes, it, it, it does present a chronic long-term risk. The question is, is there anybody testing houses that have historically flooded along the creek? Uh, we currently aren't uh, testing in any houses, uh, any basements. You know, if we're trying to protect people, that would be a good way to start because if they're in their homes and they're surrounded by contaminated soil, that might be one good way to start. This is an environmental health disaster the legacy of the Manhattan Project. So there is absolutely no doubt that there are direct and indirect risks to human health. But they said there's no health risks, but there's long-term risks. I was like, what? I didn't like that at all. Do you know what I mean? I felt like they dusted over a lot. I'm a sick person that is sick from this fucking creek. You know what I mean? Let's talk about that. What are you going to do about that? uranium for the U.S. government in downtown St. Louis starting in April of 1942. It was in total secrecy. Mallinckrodt had this extremely valuable material from the Belgian Congo, the richest uranium ore known on the planet. It was very, very radioactive, much more so than the United States uranium ore. The workers had to use code names. They didn't say uranium. They used terms like orange juice and so forth. Mallinckrodt purified all the uranium that went into the first nuclear weapons. So St. Louis was really the birth of the atomic age. We have this wonderful correspondence, okay. what they knew and what they didn't want others to know. And that box there. Do not remove any papers from this box. <laughs> so these are some I of mean, the I mean, it was very nice that Dr. Mancuso gave so these, these to me. So these are some of the... Um, I was very flattered. confidential. Um, 
Gliosarcoma brain, 48. Carcinoma of the liver, and this person was 58. Bronchiogenic carcinoma, age 62. Metastatic carcinoma, age 54. Sarcoidosis, bilateral pulmonary, age 58. Bronchiogenic carcinoma, age 48. Mallinckrodt Chemical Works, Right after World War II, like in 1946 or 47, began trucking waste out to the airport site. And of course, going from downtown, you know, they spilled stuff along the way. The truckers dumped them there and spread them out. And they did it even at night. And they said it was very beautiful because there would be sparks, because uranium is pyrophoric. It can catch on fire. The federal government decided they wanted to sell these materials that had been dumped at the airport site over an 11 or 12 year period because they were very valuable, lots of minerals and so forth. So they put ads and they did find a company called the Cotter Corporation in Colorado. They trucked just about a mile away to a place called Laddie Avenue. as an eyewitness that he recalled big dump trucks that were not covered coming and just dumping piles that looked like dirt. Rainwater was coming off of these piles and washing into the creek. Then in 1973, the wastes were trucked to Westlake Landfill by a company hired by the Cotter Corporation. The wastes were dumped there illegally. I don't remember. Do you all remember the quarry being divided like they show it now? No. Wasn't no separation and it wasn't no Westlake in Brisbane. They came up with that late on. They just assumed everybody was dead. You know, there was nobody to tell the story about yeah, it. But, but thank God that. we're here. To That's what I'm saying. Walk to the front gate to drive your car anywhere. Yeah. No restricted area, no time. I worked around the plant. I worked all up there on top, all the way around. Picked up grass, cut weeds, whatever they tell me to do. So did you all have any protectives? No, just going in no. like a man now. They didn't give you yeah. nothing. Yeah. A lot of times, they brought it in at night when there was less people working. Well, they used to dump up there all the way to, like, 12 o'clock. Yeah. They used to what? bring it in there. <clears throat> and then they would uh, they cover it up. Once they got covered up, then everybody drove over it. They had to walk over it, too. You could smell that stuff. What the world going on here this morning? Yeah. Yeah. They said they had ground that would not freeze. That was yeah. from that yeah. chemical. Yeah. Yeah. So that, it, it always was hot there. That was a hot spot. It didn't freeze there. <laughs> And it could snow, it wasn't no snow there, because when it hit, it melted, it wasn't nothing there. That stuff, you didn't know how dangerous it was. You know, you just be out there working, you know, nobody tell you nothing. And this is something, how they've tried to retain the fire and how they tried to separate it to keep it from spreading. And I just laughed and said, how can they keep it from spreading when you have it all over? Mm -hmm. There was a smell at my house and they called me and said, uh, it's a pipe with like steam and bubbly stuff and it really smells. And I'm like, all right, I'm on my way. Yeah, well, you see how it's flapping. Um, you can see and there's stuff, you can see the stuff coming out of it. Right, but I do think that that's clear water, it looks like. That's um, rainwater. 
This is Mr. Gallagher, right? No, getting. I'm so By sorry. Getting going? Getting. Oh, yes, I recall your name your on name? the MDNR letter. My name is Robin Daly. I live over here in Spanish yes, I'm Village, the, sir. I'm the landfill site engineer. <clears throat> had problems with the flare last night. I had uh -huh, crews work until uh -huh. 7 this morning. Yeah. So we weren't extracting the quantity Whoa. of gas that we were extracting. Yes. But there's a few compounds in here that are very odorous. I call them perfume, landfill perfume. Yeah, that's what I call when you bring out the odor neutralizer. You're perfuming the poison. But it's not poison. It's kind of like the church lady here, OK? Is, you know, she's got that expensive bottle of perfume. She can't smell herself anymore, so she puts a little more more on. And she sits next to you, and she's got so much perfume on it, it's almost obnoxious, OK? Mm -hmm. So. I call this, this is kind of like my church lady, all right? So my job is to control the gases that are going into the air, but a little, you know, yes, I, I, I'm getting a whiff of it here. Mr. Getting, people are really becoming ill. But I'm not, I'm not a doctor, but I can't speak to that. People but, are getting ill from it. Yeah, we've, all right. we've seen the hall logs of uh, what was dumped here. It's just I absolutely, have all the receipts. I it's have absolutely receipts. incredible. Some are not even listed. They're just like a uh, question mark unknown. time out here. December 2010 is the first time that we were aware of conditions that may be subsurface smoldering, elevated temperatures, elevated carbon monoxide. In early 2012 or so, we were observing the failure of some of the wells from heat. The wells were starting to actually kind of topple over. There were areas where we started seeing portions of the landfill drop in elevation about 15 feet or so. You know, that's pretty dramatic settlement over the course of a year. You would start seeing cracks forming in the surface. We saw cracks that were, in some cases, a foot or two wide. We also observed odors getting out of those cracks. They had a failure of part of the landfill gas extraction system and the areas where they had put black plastic down to try to capture some of the odors, they were pillowed out, you know, in some cases about 10 feet up in the air. You know, on the other side of that plastic is volatile organic compounds. In March 2013, I accompanied staff from the hazardous waste program and, you know, there were a couple hot spots that they found they found radium-226 at the ground surface. So... Does stuff blow is, off into the air? That's certainly, you know, one of the potential concerns. Okay, joining me at the table, Robin Daly, a citizen activist you have become now around this issue, and also Russ Naki, a director of field communications and public affairs at Republic Services, the owner of Bridgeton Landfill, Correct. which is right next door. So thank you for being here. Uh, Robin, I'll start with you. As a resident who, who lives how close to Westlake Landfill? Less than half a mile. Less than half of a mile. And what have, what have those uh, last four years or so been like? It's been a roller coaster ride from H-E-L-L. You, we don't know when we can open our windows. If you open your windows, then pretty soon, here comes a waft of it. Even a simple thing as hanging Christmas lights. My husband had to put on a respirator. Russ, I know you've heard these, these issues before. I'm curious, would you want to live in this area? It's actually Spanish Village and Bridgeton. It's a phenomenal community. You know, one of the concerns we have is what this hysteria is actually doing for Bridgeton and, and the future of Bridgeton. Is there something more you could do to make people at least put them at ease a little bit. Well, anytime I get an opportunity like this one, I accept it to come on and try to talk, you know, with the community about an alternative perspective that's based in science. Uh, the reality is the landfill is safe. It's intensely monitored. Oh, 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 oh. 
It's my lucky, my lucky necklace. Yes, what they got. Okay, which shoes I real quick? What's wrong with the I ones you got on? Well, nothing wrong. I have, I have, I have boots. Well, you're tall enough. What do you think? I'll wear the boots. Go. Go for the boots. <laughs> you're going to kick butt anyway, yes. so go. All right. The cat book. It's a cat book. Their new, their new mm -hmm. motto is we'll mm -hmm. take it from Rachel. here. We'll take what from That's here? That's it. That's what they're trying to pull nationwide. They're trying to do Republic. Like we'll take it from here. I think that is so hilarious. We'll take it from here. I love you, Doug. I love you too, Mom, okay? Kiss. Love you. Go get her, baby. Mwah. The Attorney General filed a major lawsuit against Republic Services that had to do with environmental violations. So the Attorney General has committed to the public that the fire will never be allowed to reach the nuclear waste. Isn't it funny that the Attorney General is the one that said the fire will never be allowed to meet the radioactive waste? Wouldn't you expect that out of EPA's mouth? Yeah, it would, would have. It would have felt good if EPA had said that. But it didn't. He was the first person to say it, and he said it early on. EPA, it seems to me they're curling up in their shell. Well, they're scared. They're going, no, 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 no. But they, but they don't want to do their job. They fucked up this site, pardon me, so badly yeah. that they don't know what to but do. The, uh, you know, they're not fooling anybody. No, they're by not. not admitting it. Thank you all. Um, this evening, we've got a couple things on our list of to-dos. The first is I want to talk about some glaring absence in the audience this evening. Um, we do not have the Environmental Protection Agency with us here this evening. Our last meeting, there was an exchange between some of our residents and the EPA. There was shouting, nothing was thrown, but the EPA has let us know that they are concerned about their well-being and our presence. Now, that being said, by Superfund law, they have to be here. And I'd be willing to have a police officer stand at the door if it makes them feel happy. If they don't come to any future meeting, we will see that as a sign that EPA is deserting us, and that is in violation of the Superfund law. Yes, Don. I just really quick would like to add that when we did that meeting with EPA, it was in the spirit of cooperation. You know, they come to these meetings and we present them with these facts. Every single thing from the one in 50 terminal cancer risk to the 39,000 tons of soil that they're not acknowledging to the error in the risk assessment to math errors, we laid it all out for them. And what I want you guys to know is that when they left that room, we took away from them plausible deniability. There is no way, using their own documents and looking at that information, that they left that room not thinking there were mistakes at this site. We said, we want you guys from this moment forward to do the right thing. You have a mandate as our EPA. Now you go do what you're supposed to do. So. Thank you, Don. Moms St. Louis have traveled to DC to meet with EPA Administrator Gina McCarthy. Oh, how are you? How are you? <laughs> okay, I'm so excited. We're ready. <laughs> 
Unfortunately, the administrator has refused to meet even after receiving a bipartisan letter requesting such a meeting. Who else has the ability to help the victims? Bill Gates does. He holds 30% of the shares in Republic Services through his investment company, Cascade Investments. This includes 17 million shares worth about 694 million purchased in 2014 alone. He has the power to convince Republic Services to do the right thing. My child has been diagnosed with a rare form of alopecia, environmentally triggered. I go to bed worrying, I wake up worrying that my five-year-old will develop cancer. Hey guys, Gina McCarthy meet today. The moms are not going away. Gina McCarthy meet today. The moms are not going away. Gina McCarthy meet today. The moms are not going away. Gina McCarthy meet today. We want to drop off a book. Is that okay? Can't do that. I'm sorry, guys, man. I'm sorry about that. Yeah, if you guys can somehow get in contact with her, then maybe... We, if we could get in contact with her, we wouldn't be here, sir. Hey, could you give it to her? Would you, would you take I, it? I can't give it to her. The moms are not going away! Gina McCarthy, meet today! The moms are not going away! We gotta watch it. With the memory today. box. The moms are not going away! Gina, Hello, come sir. out. I'm Tom Reynolds, how are you? Hi, I live in Bridgeton, Missouri. Uh, right next to the Westlake landfill. Mm -hmm. Are you able to give something directly to Gina? Yes. I would really love for you to give this picture of my son to her. Okay. And tell her that the moms are not going away and that we need her to meet with us today. Three moms. I can deliver this to the administrator and I appreciate your time. Thank All you. All right. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank Is she you. here? Thank Do you think she'll meet or no? No. It's okay. So we got to. Okay, you can't stay with me. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, we have a delivery for Bill Gates Foundation on the second floor. We have petitions. So you don't have points? No. No, no, no we just was a delivery. That would be great. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank okay. you. We'll get okay. Is it off? Yeah. Will you take our stuff? We will send this to Seattle. His family will know about it, and we have departments that handle these things. Okay. We've been trying for like nine months to reach somebody just even by phone call. Never. No one returns our no. phone. No. No one returns our emails. shirt. I love it. Thanks, Bye, Rebecca. Thank you. started, I thought if we just make these phone calls here and get these people the information they need, we'll be able to step back and they'll take it from here. I thought somebody would take it because all we needed to do was show them that it was a real problem. And that's not happened. And nobody will take this. If we got to go to Quinny's conference, please get shoes on. Oh my god. Okay, state of Missouri. Larry, I was going to ask you about the methane in the wells in the uh, North Quarry. They report methane data to us on a weekly basis, but there's no problems yes. about uh, on a biweekly basis. Okay, okay, that makes sense, because I couldn't figure out where that would be. Maybe it's not up on the page. So your carbon monoxide goes up points. I don't know that. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen all the data yet. I can't, okay. I can't say that, yeah. Hello? Dawn? Yeah. The trigger line are the order. Okay. We figure we're going to have to be back in court again. The changes that need to be made. Honey, I'm talking to the attorney general's well office. Know the ever changing situation Sophie. in the landfill. We don't expect that Republic's lawyers will be at all amenable. Um, to make I want to leave. I don't want to live here anymore. I've had enough of living in fear about the health effects to my family. And I won't lie, there's part of me that wishes that I could just pack everybody up 
and move to Florida and never have to hear about the landfill again. You know, most people I know in the community that want to get out, they can't do it. Our property value has fallen so much that we really we can't afford to move out of this house right now. Concerns tonight about an underground fire in a St. Louis County landfill, a fire that may soon spread to nearby radioactive waste. The Missouri Department of Natural Resources just released a report on the Bridgeton landfill, and News Channel 5's Grant Bissell is live in Bridgeton with what this all means. The DNR says temperature monitoring probes show part of the North Quarry is heating up. Now, beyond the North Quarry, of course, is some of the radioactive waste, and that really is the major concern here. Now, the DNR is giving the landfill's owner 30 days to come up with a new plan that will guarantee the fire is contained. Meanwhile, nearby resident Don Chapman feels progress at the dump has been too slow, and the plan should have been developed a long time ago. And I want to know why in the world are we all, and I mean the state of Missouri and specifically EPA, why are we sitting back and watching this slow moving disaster happen in the middle of St. Louis County? The most recent set of data that I got were showing some heat and some CO that was not consistent with what it has been. So I felt it was time to get back on the helicopter and get some infrared of what was going on. Good morning, Matt. Thanks for joining us. Hey, good morning, McGraw. How bad is this? There's indications that the fire is now moving through the neck area. It's closer today to the radioactive material than it's ever been. They say a thousand feet. You know, I, I think a thousand feet might be conservative. But no one's taking responsibility and no one's taking the lead. You talk to everybody, governors, senators, congressmen, public officials, Republic services, they all sort of say, well, this one's looking at it, that one's looking at it, we're going to do another study. Who is in charge of this, and who ultimately do you think is going to step in and say, we need to shut it down now? Yeah, you know, your guess is as good as mine. You heard some people earlier in the fall talking about, these were activists and, and some other folks who were involved, talking about a distance of 1,000 feet or 1,200 feet. It's not true today. It's, it's 2,500 feet. Okay, well, there's a lot of people on social media, and as you can imagine, a lot of people are listening to every word you say. I, I want it on the record because they're telling me one thing I want to hear from sure, you. Sure, absolutely. And, but. you know, here, here's the difference. i got to be accountable. If a hazardous materials incident from the landfill or from an accident in the community were to occur, there are two options available for a response, evacuation or shelter in place. Sheltering in place involves staying inside the building and shutting down air intakes where possible to limit exposure to outside air. This is the second time I've read it, actually. It's kind of slaps you in the face that they're having to prepare, like there's no solution. Our chief just parked his car at Target because there's no place to park. Wow. Yeah, it's packed, dude. This may be a new normal. They're still coming in. If everyone could just kind of squeeze together and make as much room as possible, it would be greatly appreciated. Many of you probably heard for the first time about this situation because letters came home from the schools. The news has been covering an evacuation plan. We called this emergency meeting because at this point, we have nothing in front of this fire. Why do we have to have all of this information in order to do something so common sense is to build a wall? Because every place they test, they're finding it. There is no place right now to build a wall. They don't know that they're radiation free. You That's mean. right. Uh, my honest opinion is I don't know that there's going to be a barrier wall. I think you all have to accept the fact that there might not be a way to put a barrier wall into that situation. Thank you for saying so. it. Then remove it. I've been here 10 minutes. I've known about this two days, and this is insane. 
This is nuts. This Welcome is to my Everything world. Everything you guys say is get the bulldozers, get the nuclear waste out, and move. And the fire you can deal with later, but they're never going to do that. I don't disagree they're with you. They're never going to do that. I don't disagree with you. Welcome to the party, pal. Yeah. 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 I'm going to have Mark Dietrich come up and answer a lot of the questions that you may have about the emergency planning. I just want to take a moment to explain what shelter in place and uh, evacuation means. Uh, what I would urge you to do is to create your own disaster plan for your family. Other than the people that are here right now, no one is aware this is even existing, that there is an emergency plan to have in place. And that's no why I'm here. Aware. We won't know how far anything's going to reach until the event happens. I mean, I understand that that's not an answer that you want to hear, and I apologize for that, but it is the best information that is available. Next. I moved from Chernobyl 20 years ago to save my daughter. My in-laws, both of them, died from cancer. My aunt died from cancer. My 30 years old cousin diagnosed with cancer. My mom, cancer survivor. My dad passed away from brain cancer last year. Do you want that for your children? What about your life? Who will pay for all of those expenses for the cancer, for lupus, for breathing problem, for asthma? Who will pay for that? I think that the government has to be held responsible. And people were elected to defend your interest. And whose interest are they defending? Money interest. You can't be quiet anymore. This is just from those heavy rains from last night. You know, Wednesday, this was dry. In the 20 plus years that you've lived here, how far is that water from the creek backed up to your? It, it, most of it came up to about this street. OK, so you moved in basically in the late 80s. 92. 92, and we had the flood in 93. Right. So that's probably when you had it up to the back, uh, yeah. to the back door. That's right. Yeah. Well, they started purifying uranium right. for the Manhattan Project I, or for I read that the Defense Department. Right. And may I make a remark? Yes. My wife and I are cancer survivors. I probably do today. OK. When I moved to Florence in 1974, my son was three years old. <clears throat> And he has stage four appendix. I know. It's not easy. Yeah. Like right here is really long. Well, okay. listen, first of all, let's not let's not stretch the truth. <laughs> like when I lost my hair, all of this right here was completely bald. But I kept a little hair here and a little hair here. You can put Jaffe in retirement. Jaffe needs to retire. She's been a real pain in the butt lately. She's not wind friendly. Don't wear a wig in the wind. It doesn't work out. As she lays there dead like a <laughs> like a like a tired cat. Wow, it's like happy hour. Just to kind of, this is the thing with this style, she can really do a lot of really cute different things with it. So I think that it might be time to say goodbye to the wig. It looks a lot better. 
And so, so now you're. I think you actually look like the picture you showed her of um, Charlie Theron with the dark hair when it's combed over in the front. It looks yeah. Like it looks just like that, I think. I look just like Charlie. You look just like him. I know. I'm going to try to convince Mike that when I get home. <laughs> <laughs> I went this week for cancer scans, and I go tomorrow for the results. So I'm just going with everything's good. Every little thing's going to be all right. Every little thing. It's going to be all right. outside now. There appear to be spots in the spine and the bones. The brain scan is showing 13 spots. Uh, is this changing my stage of cancer? Yes. To, to four? Yes. Are you fucking kidding me? Yeah. You did everything. And you followed through with everything that was said. So this is not for the lack of you trying. Keep your positive attitude. Keep oh, what good is my positive attitude done? I've done everything. Every single thing. It's done a lot for you. If you yeah, but you're still alive. You don't have pain. <laughs> Just. You had dreams. So stage four cancer is not curable. It's livable. Let's put it that way. It's not curable, but you can live with it. I know. I know. All these different types of cancers could be associated with the exposure from the site. But to really say that for an individual that their cancer was caused from the site would require a huge dose reconstruction, it'd be easily a $10 million study. One of our worst fears from day one was that we were going to have downstream, down the creek stream, we were going to have more radiation found. And now we're finding out today officially that yes, they found things. So now we have a massive problem because our theories of the transport of the radionuclides downstream is a reality. Good evening, everyone. I'm Joanne Wade from the Corps of Engineers. Um, we have areas of contamination that we found along Coldwater Creek. We found um, contamination at Sainton Park, Duchenne Park, and Archer Asselson properties. Are kids allowed to play in those parks while you're digging? Yeah, the parks are currently open, yes. So on a windy day while you're digging, <coughs> children can play in the parks? I just answered that question. They can, yes. Yes, hi, I'm Matt Zimmerman, I'm the city manager. The reason why we made that decision was we were going into the summer season. We have a lot of children and high schoolers who like to use that park. It's a, it's a heavily used yeah. park. So, because it's a busy season, go ahead and expose the children. It's in the soil. The girl, wasn't the Girl Scouts there for an entire weekend? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
we got asphalt, and we got cement. And these were used in our homes, our streets, and our highways. So how can we separate the two? What's been found here, to my understanding, is thorium-230. You know, so that's some pretty nasty stuff. It goes everywhere from six inches to five foot deep. You know, that's, man, that's just not acceptable. The originated point of Mellencrot, where it came from, took my father. And this part's taking my son. Currently for fiscal 2017, we are in the president's budget for about 24 and a half million. The funding is not enough to accelerate the program and do it in a much more rapid form. The biggest frustration is insufficient funds and insufficient time. Light people get poisoned. I, I really just want to throw punch. We'd like to thank you all for being here. And we have EPA to respond to any questions that we might have. Agency decided based on the data we've seen, based on the information we have for the site and how it relates, community concern, we're gonna, we told the parties to install an isolation barrier. We're negotiating that order right now. And our intent is to get that order out as soon as we can. We're hoping this month, perhaps next, but again, it's negotiation at this point. But we are going to take action. We are going to issue an order this year, not next year, this year. The part of the landfill that's burning, I guess the South Quarry, has that ever been tested for REM? The South Quarry has not been tested for REM, no ma'am. So I guess this is my question then. How can any kind of a barrier go up if you don't test what's currently burning right now? Because if the REM's already where there's fire, the barrier means nothing. Well, the history of the landfills does not demonstrate that rim was placed in area in two. In history, you guys said there was no rim outside of the boundaries, and now there is. So... I, I follow the logic, but again, based on the history of the site... Based all the on the history that has been wrong. Right. Why wouldn't you test it? I understand, That's all man. I'm asking. I know, I know. Are and you afraid again, of... I mean, to me, as a resident, I feel like you're afraid of the answer.
one is sure how the radioactive soil ended up in the dense vegetation you see behind me here along St. Charles Rock Road. What is certain is the EPA now knows it's there. My message to other moms who find themselves in a similar situation, Superman's not coming. Sometimes you, you have to be your own superhero. You know, this is an urgent issue here, as I'm sure you're very well aware. We don't know exactly how far the fire is from the waste. We can't say that the, the waste isn't already burning. I have to tell you, in all honesty, that uh, I would dramatically characterize it differently. I do know that a robust monitoring system that we have and that we're continuing to embellish tells us what's in the air. And so uh, I think continuing to say that the radioactive waste At this time, how far is the fire from the known radioactive waste? My understanding from the measurements we've seen, it's, it's just under 700 feet. So oh. that's, that's the understanding we have. <laughs> that's it, yes. Can you give us a swear on the Bible, 100% oh, right. that this community is not being exposed in a radioactive waste? Ma'am, I can guarantee you with 100% from me, the data I've seen, and the information I've looked at. I have not seen any data that's demonstrated there's a human exposure, otherwise I would have the authority to take an action on that. I will tell you that the people I represent do not want anything short of a full excavation. We also would like a voluntary buyout during construction and remedy process. I can't promise it's gonna be full excavation. I know that's what a lot of folks can't live without. It has to be what I can do within the law and the box that I live and work with. It's 2016 today. Question is, are we gonna be sitting in this room in 2024 with still nothing done at the landfill? You know, we've spent months trying to learn what we can about the situation here and also about your situation in this particular house. We've received the results and, and um, they do show that there is radioactive contamination in the home. Uh, we're talking about radioactive isotopes like lead-210, thorium-230, radium-226. Uh, and furthermore, the scientists who have done this work are able to fingerprint the wastes that are here uh, as the same material that was dumped in the, in the Westlake landfill, the original Malincrot 
radioactive waste. And, and unfortunately, your neighborhood and your home is now part of that, that story. And, and the contamination is, is in the house. Never would have realized, guessed in a billion years that this could possibly happen to you. That just... How long is this going to take? Will we be relocated? That's what I really want, because we really don't want to stay here. The EPA can have this house. They can sell it to somebody else after they get it remediated. I've already spent enough time here. I don't want to be here any longer. Talk, 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 and no action. If they do any action, it's half-ass action. It's delayed action. It's not even the right action. It's just not right. Good evening, Council. I am one of the residents that has the contamination from the Westlake Landfill Manhattan Project Rad Waste in their home. I moved there in 1999. I didn't know I was living and moving next to a radioactive super fund. Had no idea. It's a big secret in St. Louis. They don't even allow you to disclose it. It's not necessary when you're buying a home. I didn't sign up to live next to one, and I sure as heck didn't want to be contaminated by one because EPA and Republic Services said, there's nothing to worry about. We know where all the rad waste is, and we know exactly where it is off-site. And it's not where you're at. Well, guess what? I'm contaminated now. And I wanted you to know that I have heavily landscaped my yard since 1999. My husband and I have dug holes almost two feet deep to plant trees and other things. So, I mean, we are really into it up to here with this stuff. And now it's in my house, too. We've got irrefutable, indisputable proof this is in thorium that can be found in the United States. It has a monzonite signature, which is a fingerprint, a DNA, that traces it all the way back to Shinka Loboy Mine in the Belgian Congo. Now, there's no way in H-E-L-L -L, I got that from anywhere but the Westlake landfill, because that cannot be had on these United States soil. So all I can say is here's the face of contamination when we were constantly told not to worry about it. My government has failed me. The EPA has failed me. My God, we're referred to as those people, those people up there that are bringing trouble into our neighborhood. By continuing the silence, it creates the apathy and it perpetuates the lie. And the lie continues and the homes get sold and the unsuspecting homeowners keep coming and coming and coming. Why, my house can't be remediated. You know why? Because the source of where it came from is still there, and it still has the rad waste in it. So that's my sad story. I look to the council. I'm looking for some help. I'm looking for more than, you know, we're really sorry. I, I know you're all sorry, and that is a genuine feeling. But I've heard enough of that. We are a hurting community. Not everybody wants to leave, but I do. located here in the city hall. Yeah, we so just no one's ever really told me that, you know, that they're yeah, Isn't that something? I work here and even that's a secret. Well, uh, we just got off the phone with, you know. 
I'm, I'm, I don't sit here. I only do this for lunch. I understand, reception. but you would think that every employee would know that the that that's a good in book. here is Mr. Uh -huh. Brad Van right now. Okay, come on. This is who we want to talk to. Hey, Brad. Hey, Don. How you doing? Good. Good to see you. Come in and talk. Yeah. Hi, Brad. Nice How you doing? You. Good to see yeah. you, too. Hi, Hello. my name is Robin Daly. Hi. I'm uh, the resident in uh, Spanish Village that has had the contamination found in her home and on her property. After we've been told by you guys, as well as Republic Services, that you know where the rad waste is and you know where it's offsite at. But you never ever came up the hill a half a mile south of the landfill to test our neighborhoods. You just kept us all in the dark, saying it was okay, nothing to be concerned about, and now we're living amidst it. How am I gonna fix Thanksgiving dinner when it's in my kitchen? And you're all welcome to come on in. We'd love uh, to. Please leave the cameras and the uh -huh. Camera crew behind, be happy to talk with you all. Thank you. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Under section 10 of Stuttgart, does this trigger imminent threat? Well, okay, and I, and I can't answer that question. Let me yes. talk with my attorney. Right. I think the, the first thing, if there's data that you can provide us, you know, first step is we gotta get this confirmed. Because in order for relocation, it has to be part of the remedy decision. Mm -hmm. okay. How would you not think, with it laying on the surface of that landfill, that it would not have been wind blown into the subdivision we have monitors all the way around. Have you guys seen particles at all? Everything's been below levels that are acceptable. But filters. there are some below yeah, levels. Yeah, you'll find some, but they're below levels of, of uh, residential use, actionable use. So if you're finding levels being released from the site, what does 43 years of combination of that leaving the site, especially when there wasn't vegetation? And I can't, I can't back this. I know where you're going. Oh, I can okay. tell you right now, if there's particulates, but are the particulates of concern? No, not that I can see. He did admit something, Harvey, that I don't know if you were aware of or not, but you know those particle detectors that are around the sites? Yeah. Did you know they're picking up radioactive particles in them? No. Uh, yeah, and they have been, just not at quote-unquote actionable levels. No shit. I, I, I kid you not. Karen, am I making it up? No, that's what he said. That's what he said. This agency knows how that stuff got in her house. I mean, they know better. They're not stupid. They're not surprised by this. They're surprised that somebody else found it. I, I can tell you right now, I don't want to live here anymore. I, I'm done. I, I do not want to raise my kids in this home. I get on Zillow every night, look and dream of all these houses I want. Just to get out of here, I don't want much. I just want out of here and I, we can't afford it. For the longest time, our own government has told us that our home was safe. They have told us, when you encounter the odor, get out of it. Go inside. That's where you go to be safe from outdoor things that could harm you. All right, love you. Night, night. Love you, too. All right, you got all your dollies? All right. You did, but only know what they have now. All right, well, I love you very much, OK? Come on, Cookie. Night, night, baby, okay?